as a boy, it was ABs and KAs that I mainly saw. And uh, I guess I've got a secret little love affair with ABs. I think they're a stunning little engine. Wherever you went in New Zealand, uh, there was always an AB shunting somewhere. The ABs always seemed to be doing the branch line work and they were the most ubiquitous of the steam locomotives in New Zealand. The story of locomotive AB663, Sharon Lee, began at the Addington Railway Workshops in Christchurch in 1917. The first AB class locomotive built there two years earlier was a development of the very successful A class four cylinder compound locomotives that were operated from 1906. The ABs were built up to 1925 by three different locomotive works as superheated simple engines and 663 was built in the second batch. Sharon Lee was the first AB allocated to Auckland and much later was transferred south to Dunedin. She regularly ran up the Otago Central branch to the terminus of the line at Cromwell before finally seeing out her days on the west coast of the South Island based at Greymouth. At the end of 1968, most of New Zealand's remaining steamers was concentrated in the South Island. A lot of the engines had been scrapped by this time, diesels had taken over. 1969, Reed and I purchased our first locomotive, which ironically was AB795, latterly then taken <laughs> for the use on the Kingston Flyer. We had to change what we were going to buy, it led Reed and I to reserving three of the J-Class that were left at the time. Of course, going back to 1970, to buy one steam engine was a pretty reckless move, uh, let alone even think about buying two. But buying one engine actually built quite a lot of confidence. And about 1972-73, we had to cast eye around to see if we could get an AB. By that time, they'd all been cut up, apart from the two on the Kingston Flyer. Plains Railway had one at this stage. Uh, there'd been one preserved in the North Island by MOTAP. The only remaining one really on railway property was 663 which was quite a famous engine that pulled the, I think it was the Duke of Gloucester back in about 1918 when they did a Royal Tour in 1919, whenever that was. It was decided to retain it as a spare for the flyer and it was moved down to Dunedin, to the back of the Dunedin Railway Depot. It had been robbed of a lot of parts, its chimney had been sacrificed to go somewhere and it was the locomotive only, the tender had been taken by that time. The railways decided they no longer wanted the engine and they put it up for tender. Fortunately, there was also an AB tender which belonged to the railways that they had taken down to Invercargill. So I put a tender in for the engine and fortunately my tender was successful. I forget what I paid for it now, but it was certainly well beyond the scrap value. So having won the tender, I also managed to acquire the, the spare AB tender. I think it was off 811 if I recall. A lot of people in the railways were very helpful and we managed to get space at the hut shops and we managed to get permission to go on the weekends and start restoration. The only good thing on the engine was the inner firebox, that's all I could say, everything else was terrible. And we actually moved the engine out of the hut shops after about a five year period and we went to Silverstream and virtually finished it, well we did finish the restoration at Silverstream took the opportunity at the time to convert it to roller bearings. We put roller bearings right through apart from the main drivers. And we also converted the engine from coal-fired to oil-fired. I'm very grateful to the Silverstream Railway for the help that they gave in getting it going. In 1997, following successful test runs on the Silverstream Railway, Sharon Lee was moved to the former Upper Hutt goods shed and made ready for mainline certification. We had to take it up by truck. Um, there was no rail access to Silverstream. The engine weighs about 70 odd tonnes, so it wasn't not like trying to move a J or a KA. The certification test run was made to Levin, and not long after this, the first passenger trip behind AB663 to be conducted by mainline steam was to Taumarunui. This was held in conjunction with a trip run from Auckland with J1211, and both trains were combined for a joint run to National Park, travelling up the famous Raurimu Spiral along the way. We did about three or four trips almost in succession once we got it going. The conditions at the good shed were somewhat primitive, but the good friendships forged were more than enough to overcome any inconveniences. Maintaining and running steam locomotives is a dirty and hard undertaking, and in late August of 2000, the volunteers at Upper Hutt 
After having completed a boiler washout, we're preparing 663 for an excursion when these video clips were taken. Over the next three years, during the time Sharon Lee was based in Upper Hutt, a number of excursions were organised, encompassing much of the lower half of the North Island. Yeah, we've done some great things with that AB. The Millennium Trip at Beach Loop at 5am we put on a breakfast and we took the AB up there. And, yeah, that was quite a memorial, wasn't it? In late October 2012, travellers from various countries around the world were on Mainline Steam's New Zealand countrywide tour train. We joined them at Wellington, and this is the story of our three-day journey to Wairoa and back to Palmerston North with steam locomotives JA1275 and AB663. Well, uh, I have been a train enthusiast for a great many years, uh, to the point that I'm also driving a steam locomotive. And of course in Europe for the moment it's winter season, so the trains, the tourist trains don't run anymore. So it's um, on holiday, on trains again. What I like with this particular tour is uh, you discover a country because it's the first time for me in New Zealand. This is my first trip to New Zealand and it's been extremely good. I've enjoyed it so far. Lovely steam engines, lovely countryside and very, very nice people. The taxi driver even gave me a lift to Silverstream Station yesterday for nothing. <laughs> Paikakariki, where we've now reached, was once a busy steam locomotive depot, originally built in the early 1880s by the Wellington and Manawatu Railway Company, where engines were changed or added for the steep grades south to Wellington. Unlike many of the people on this trip, I'm not really a steam fan so much as I am just a, uh, a railway enthusiast. I enjoy trains, I enjoy the uh, experience of, of riding trains, and uh, uh, I enjoy seeing what the different operating practices and procedures are uh, around the world. Ortaki is our first stop to top up the locomotive's tenders with water, and the Heritage Station, which has been recently restored by local volunteers, replaces Otaki's first station, built in 1911. This will be the first of many such stops during the next three days at locations with convenient fire hydrants as we travel up the country.
travelled all over the world to see steam traction on the railways where you know this last year South Africa, China, Canada, places like that. But it's the first time I've ever been to New Zealand and the trip's gone like clockwork really. It's been very interesting, the scenery's been beautiful and the other people on the train have been uh, very interesting people to talk to and um, it's been a very enjoyable experience overall I think it's fair to say. The station at Palmerston North that we're now pulling up alongside was built in the 1960s as part of a new deviation to reroute the railway away from the middle of the commercial centre of the city. The lead engine, JA1275, is being detached and will run through to a rail preservation group's depot and fielding. And Sharon Lee will head the train by herself as we arrive back here in three days' time. AB663 is the oldest tender engine regularly running on New Zealand's mainline tracks and has been to many parts of New Zealand since her restoration in 1997, including some time spent in the South Island based at Mainline Steam's Christchurch Depot. While there, Sharon Lee headed an excursion over the Southern Alps back to her old haunt at Greymouth, and the following scenes are from a film made in 2004 that documented this trip. It was such a trip to Arthur's Pass in 1969 that provided the inspiration needed to motivate Ian Welsh and Reid McNaught to approach the railways to acquire their first steam locomotive. In 2006, a celebration was held to mark the 100 years since the opening of the Dunedin Railway Station, and 663 went south to take part in the festivities. Being back at one of her old stamping grounds was enough of an excuse to run her back up the Tyree Gorge on the Otago Central Railway.
Back with the rail tour, we depart from Palmerston North and will soon be passing through the very scenic Manawatu Gorge, where the railway and road cling to opposite sides of the Manawatu River. We've come over 12,000 miles to New Zealand to this mainline steam trip. I was here about seven years ago and had a super time in New Zealand and decided to come back again. And it's the steam that we really want. And we like to film the trains when they have these things called run pasts. We really enjoy that. Then we get home, we put all our videos together and make films out of them and show them to our friends. And I invited my two friends, but I, I'm not paying for them because it's very expensive to come here. It costs us $2,000 and 24 hours to get here. We started in Christchurch yep. and then we shall finish in um, Auckland. Yep. You can see the scenery better from the steam train than you can from the roads. All our holidays are on steam trains. We never go, we've been all over the world on steam trains. Yeah. I use uh, this iPad thing here for uh, with a moving map on it. And I've got all the all detailed maps of all of New Zealand on there. Passing by the now disused Woodville Railway Station, which is at the junction with the Wairarapa line that connects with Wellington, there's little evidence remaining to suggest that this was once a major steam depot with a very busy railway yard. One of the added attractions of this tour is the opportunity of travelling on the accompanying tour bus that keeps ahead of the train to provide line-side photo opportunities for passengers. When steam trains were an everyday affair, most people paid little attention, but now that they are somewhat scarce, young children, especially in remote localities, easily get excited by rare visits of these great fire-breathing monsters. We're about to stop at Danneberg, which is at the southern extremity of the Hawke's Bay region, to once again top up the locomotive tender with water. Oh, 
Boilers' fire tubes need regular cleaning and sand is fed into the small fire hole to remove any soot to improve the ability of the boiler to produce steam. A small team travelling ahead of the excursion in a vehicle reaches Waipukarao to lay out hoses from the nearest fire hydrant to minimise any delay to the train. Hastings is one of the few cities in New Zealand where the railway still bisects the town centre and, as can be seen, this corridor has been nicely rejuvenated and is now an attractive part of the city. Arriving at the now disused railway station, we reached the end of our first day's journey at Napier, where in 1931 a major earthquake flattened much of the city, and as a consequence, it now has a unique Art Deco identity. For the passengers, it's off to their hotel and a relaxing evening, but for the mainline steam crew, it'll be some hours before they can sit back and relax. The crew generally after that have three to four hours work depending on which locomotive it is. So the, the engine and the train itself will be shunted into the yard at Pandora. The engine and the tank wagons will then be disconnected. The engine itself is then disconnected from the tanks put alongside the oil wagon. Uh, oil is then pumped from the oil wagon into the, the bunker on the tender of the AV. 
At the same time, if your hydrant is close enough, you'll be filling the water in the tender and, if necessary, the water in the water tank that goes with you on the trips. At the same time as that's being done, other crew will be looking at uh, the greasing. Someone will be looking in the cab itself to fill lubricators and check that the operation of all of the gauges and so forth are up to scratch. And at the same time, if you've got sufficient people with you, there will be someone who will be giving the engine a clean uh, to get rid of some of the, the dirt and grime that may have come from that day's trip. All of that can take three hours, sometimes more than that. Uh, at the end of all of that work, you get the engine up to almost its pressure. So with the AB, you get it up to between 170, 180 ensure that the boiler is full of water and then you'll shut it down for the night, uh, clean out the oil pipe and at that point you'll put the various pieces back, a lid on the funnel, uh, the pins into the snifters and take off the cylinder clock uh, levers uh, and then you'll screw down the handbrake and go back to a very late night in the motel. The maintenance team have decided to replace the piston rod steam gland packings and it'll be well after dark before these are finally in place. It's not only during excursions that maintenance needs to be done, as there's a lot of work done prior to getting a locomotive ready for a trip. At her home base at Plymouthton, Sharon Lee was fired up a week before she was scheduled to leave from Wellington for a boiler check by an inspector. It's done for safety purposes because you have a vessel that sits at 180 or 200 pounds depending on the loco. It's a fairly lengthy process. It's a costly process in time and sometimes in material as well. Generally, it, you're required to declad the firebox um, take off a number of the instrument gauges and so forth that are on the back head, uh, give the inspector access to those bits of the boiler that he or she wishes to inspect. People who work with the steam engines at Plymouthton and all the other depots around the country are well trained and the best prevention and safety is actually continual maintenance of your loco. Water in the end is the saviour. The steel that's used in it and the water that is around the inside are such that the heat from the fire transferring through to the water and the water then boiling to the pressure that the safety valves are set at. Oil and coal, both of them burn very hot, uh, but you've got water sitting on the other side of that steel and the balance between the two is sufficient to keep that steel at the right temperature so that it doesn't go down. The day before, the team are at work again, firing up the two locomotives and putting the tank wagons in the correct positions, ready to depart to Wellington early the next morning. You probably need about eight days to get a steam engine ready for a trip. Uh, not eight days in total, but over a period of eight days, because the first thing that you do is you actually inspect the engine itself. So. Um, the person who's certified to sign off on various pieces of equipment on the engine will be going through doing a check for all of those things, signing off that all of the safety uh, features of the engine are functioning, that any repairs that are required from a previous trip are completed, and then you gradually warm up the boiler. The day before the trip you will do a lot of preparation work, you will ensure that you've got all of your combustibles so your oil tender in the case of the, the AB is full, the water is full. You'll then go around and you'll put lubrication into various spots. You'll go around and do hard greasing and soft greasing. So 
there's plenty of things to do on the day before a trip. On overnight excursions, the crew are up at first light to fire up the boiler and lubricate the moving parts on the loco in readiness for the day's journey. The Napier Kiwi Rail locomotive depot is some distance from where the passengers board and it'll take some time to reverse the train back to the station. Today, the train will be full with additional local passengers having bought tickets to be part of what may be the final passenger rail journey on this line. Stopping for a final top-up of water at Bayview, where there's a very convenient hydrant, brings out some of the local residents who would only experience a steam train blocking their street on very rare occasions. Here, railway enthusiasts have restored and preserved the tiny station precinct at Waiponga. The railway line used to run right through my family farm at Kopuafra and I was hoping to get there today but I find that we're only going as far as wire also, a bit disappointed. From here the railway continues its steep climb up the Esk Valley and will soon reach the first of the seven tunnels we'll pass through before arriving at Wairoa.
these railway sidings in Waikowal are now the only remaining trace that was once a large sawmilling plant in operation, along with a thriving community. I've come to New Zealand because it's a beautiful country. I've been interested in steam trains ever since I was a young fellow. This is the last bastion of the real authentic steam tour. When I was 17, I worked for the railways in the, in the goods office. That's actually when we had a very active railway business operating. As a young girl, most of the men that worked in the backyard clearing and filling the wagons, they were rough and ready lot, but they, they certainly looked after us. This broken country required numerous viaducts to make this railway possible and the high barriers were essential to prevent trains being blown over the side. We've already passed over three high steel viaducts and this one, crossing the Mohaka River, is not only the highest on this line, but also the highest in New Zealand. It's 275 metres long, and the deck we're on sits 95 metres above the water, and there's still one more steel viaduct to cross before we reach Wairoa.
um, re-watering the locomotive at some point. I don't know whether they're going to do that before they go out to the train or after. It's your responsibility to come back and be on the train when we actually leave. Approaching today's destination at Wairoa, we feel saddened that this may be the very last passenger train to arrive here. This railway line has been under threat of closure for some years now, and two substantial washouts occurring during a storm earlier in the year have led to the closure of the northern part of the line. After a review of the future potential of the line, Kiwi Rail announced just before this trip departed that it planned to mothball the railway north of Napier before the end of 2012. I come down especially today from Waihe to see the train. So uh, a lot of memories in this hat has been up and down the main trunk and on the Taniar Tour Express, the Rotorua Express, up to the Glen Afton Mines, out to Cambridge, up to Thames to Price's Engineering where they built some of the AB locomotives. As this is as far as we can go on this line, the locomotive, along with the tank wagon, has just been turned facing back towards Napier on a triangular set of rails just to the north of the station. With the threat of closure, local residents have been eager for tourism operators to bring trains here in an effort to encourage authorities to keep the rail line open. It livens the whole town up. Yeah. And not only that, brings a lot of people people up here, you know. This little bit of equipment here on the tender is helping to re-rail the train if it comes off. And I've just noticed here that it says Fellows Brothers Limited, Engineers, Cradley Heath, England. That's where I come from. Yeah, it's all your fault that we're enjoying ourselves here. Yeah? Well, I know. Well, mate, I, it's a terrible responsibility. Yeah. I remember, I remember going to hang myself and cut my throat. <laughs> Construction of this railway originally commenced in 1911 and was opened to Puterino in 1930. However, it was not until the completion of the Mohaka Viaduct in 1937 that the line could finally be opened beyond Wairua to Waikokopu in 1939. It would not be until 1942 that the whole line to Gisborne would be open to traffic. 
The government of the day were very proud of their achievements in respect to the Napier to Gisborne Railway, and Robert Semple, the Minister of Public Works at the time, noted during his speech at the opening of the line that the Mohaka viaduct contained 1,900 tonnes of steel, was completed in record time, and was an outstanding example of what New Zealand engineers and builders can do. This last photo opportunity for today's passengers attracts a wide audience, including from passing cars, and will be at a sedate speed owing to the age of the old estuary bridge.
Many of the passengers reaching the end of their day's trip will no doubt be reflecting that they may have become part of history, being on the last passenger rail journey north of Napier. With these 8mm film clips taken in the mid-1970s when rail cars were running regular daily services between Napier and Gisborne, we cast back to the years when the line was a lifeline for the communities that lived along it. The line was closed twice during the period of its construction, firstly due to the Napier earthquake in 1931, and then by severe floods in 1938. 22 workers constructing the line at the time, and who were camped near this spot, drowned in a flash flood that raced down the river, and the memorial we can see was erected to commemorate them. These clips illustrate a time when rail travel was a common means of commuting to and from remote communities, and the local railway station was a busy and important part of the community. Rail car services commenced once the line was open and were a popular means of travel, as evidenced by this busy scene at the Wairoa station, a very distant image from what we saw there earlier in the day. In those days, rail transport was an important means of conveying all kinds of freight, and even small wayside stations had sizable railway yards. With its remote locality, the Napier to Gisborne Railway traverses some of New Zealand's most rugged and scenic countryside, and has been a visual delight for passengers since its opening. It certainly is one of the most scenic lines. I'd rate Christchurch Arthur's Pass as probably the most scenic. Uh, certainly a very spectacular line, but so is Gisborne. So I guess we've got to see what happens in the future. Well, of course, this trip was to Wairoa, which, with the threatening of the closure, may be the last trip. I'm hopeful that the line will stay open. I guess it's in the hands of our political masters. Ian would love to be able to run more steam tours over this line, but the economics prohibit him, considering the operation and maintenance of it. But a train, you'd really need a minimum of 200, up to 400 people to make it pay. It's very expensive running out there on the main line. It's very expensive to operate a steam locomotive. Uh, they do about uh, five gallons to the mile when you're burning oil, or you'll burn 10 tonnes of coal, and coal's about $350 a tonne, so to do a trip for a day, you're talking 3,500 just for your fuel. You've got to have a lot of customers to make, to make it pay. Sadly, the, this applies to all of New Zealand. We, I think we get about one and a half or two million tourists a year into the country. We're a long way from the tourism markets. Whether we like it or not, we are at the bottom of the world. It's very expensive to get here. I mean, for anyone in the Northern Hemisphere to come to New Zealand, it's quite a commitment, both in time money and the thought of that 24-hour plane journey. Early the next day, we departed from Napier for the last leg of our rail journey back to Palmerston North.
Approaching the historic Ormondville railway station, which dates from 1880, we're about to cross this distinctive viaduct, originally built during the same period. Ormondville Station has been preserved by the local community and now offers unique boutique accommodation for travellers. Passing back through Woodville, we're getting close to our destination. But for the passengers on the tour, they'll stay overnight at Palmerston North before a long day tomorrow travelling back to Auckland and the end of their New Zealand steam railway experience. As we pull up alongside the Palmerston North railway station platform once again, we look back on a tiring but enjoyable three days as we chased alongside and rode on the train.
Sharon Lee has performed admirably, considering she's nearly 100 years old. And that's a testament to the rugged design and construction by her engineers at Addington so long ago. During the first period of AB663's life, she was tended by a considerable team of craftsmen to keep her wheels turning. Now, during the second stage of her life, there's but a small group of enthusiasts to do the same job. That AB663 has performed so well since being returned to mainline duties is a credit to the dedication of all the members of mainline STEAM who've worked so hard on her. We set out to tell a story about the role AB663 Sharon Lee has played in the past and the new role that she performs today. We've had an interesting and entertaining time during the making of this movie and we hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have.